first afternoon session of the conference. And it's on the report that the uh, conference organizers have produced, Civilization, States, and World Order, which were all in your conference packs, and I hope that you will read if you haven't read them already. And the author of this report, Richard Higgett, is here on the stage with me this afternoon. He's a research professor at the Institute for European Studies, Free University in Brussels. And my name is Christopher Coker, and I am the author of a book called The Rise of the Civilization State and the Unmaking of World Order. I also have the privilege of being co-director of LSE Ideas, which is also a partner, as you'll see, of the conference. We're going to have a 15-minute session in which I will ask Richard some questions about the report, and then we're going to go after that into a larger panel discussion. I will invite the panelists at that point to come up and join me on the stage. So without further ado, I shall sit down uh, in the most informal way. Uh, let me just make a few opening remarks. Uh, civilization state, when did it actually start? Well, it, it entered public currency. In other words, it entered the political domain as recently as 2013 at the Valdai conference when Vladimir Putin described Russia for the first time, I think, I beg to be corrected, as a civilization state. And at the 19th Party Congress, Xi Jinping, some years ago, also referred to China as a civilization state. There are a number of uh, points that one could make, which are both positive and negative about the concept. The positive uh, is that uh, civilization has become the currency of international politics, I think uh, for good in some respects because we're moving away from what Martin Jakes once described as Euro-provincialism, which is, uh, in a sense, privileging the European Enlightenment as being the be-all and end-all of the debate about values. There are other civilizations and other values that have been airbrushed out of history for the last 250 years, and they're coming back, and they're represented by many of the speakers at this conference. The negative elements, and there are negative elements, is that it is a highly elitist idea. I don't know how, to what extent it has much popular purchase in countries like China and Russia, or whether it's just an intellectual discourse. We must always be careful in an age of populism that we don't engage in uh, intellectual discourses. Another criticism in my own civilization, the West, is that it seems to be an authoritarian discourse. Uh, the, I think the interesting case is India, where uh, Modi has made uh, no uh, attempt to disguise his wish to make India into a civilizational state, but that has, of course, produced an enormous amount of criticism from people who think that it will be shanghaied by ethno-nationalists who really don't think that the Muslim uh, presence in India, or indeed the Muslim era of Indian history, which has been a very extensive one, is actually part of Indian civilization. But I, here I am discussing, Richard, some other points which bear on uh, economics and the economics agenda. Because when we're talking about the civilizational state, I think two responses will be. One, well, it's all really about the economy, isn't it? And the second is that the civilizational state, we mentioned the environment today, privileges the human all the time and culture, perhaps over the planet and the environment and the global. So, Richard, if I could ask you, first of all, where, when this debate begins, I think, in Asia is over the Asian values debate in the 1980s, where we were told that Asians invested more in their children's future, that uh, they were more productive, uh, and that this was the beginning of the end of the Western moment in history. Value in economics has been there since Max Weber's essay on the Protestant, the Protestant ethic. He was very interested in Confucianism and China. Could you just say something about economics and values? Happy, happy to, and thank you for the, the plug for the report, uh, Chris. I love the, the idea of the use of the word Shanghai, by the way, in this context. Uh, very unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me say two things by way of starter, and then specifically to Chris's comment. When I started writing this report, uh, the, the tools that we usually work with in, in international relations are, are geostrategic ones and geoeconomic ones. And it was quite clear that, and they usually operate uh, individually, it was quite clear that, that there was a missing dimension. Uh, the dimension that Chris has uh, referred to with the rise of the idea of civilization and culture uh, and geoculture. And of course, the, the dominant tradition, particularly since the end of the, the Cold War period, 
the rise of globalization was the absolute ascendancy of uh, economic science, and it thought of itself as a science, as the dominant ordering principle of the world, particularly Hayekian uh, understandings. Uh, and there was no role in this uh, scientific approach towards understanding world order for what we might call the cultural dynamics uh, of international relations. This, of course, all changed. Uh, the backlash against globalization, which didn't happen overnight, but if you wanted to put a, a date on it, it's 2008. Uh, or if you're Asian, you would put the first Asian financial crisis of 1997 uh, on it. Uh, but it became clear that economic science didn't actually do everything and tell everything for us uh, in the way the world worked. Uh, and what scholars in various parts of the world were trying to do was bring in what we might call, for want of a better expression, the non-scientific elements of the economy. And that meant culture uh, and civilization. Uh, and a couple of reasons for this, and one of them, not the least of which was the backlash against globalization uh, that took place in a range of different parts of the world. Uh, no one doubts that the ability of globalization is the world's greatest aggregator of wealth over time. But of course, its distributional consequences were massively uneven. Uh, and the major beneficiaries of it, ironically, were the half a billion people in China and the half a billion people in India who saw themselves progressively lifted uh, in this process. And the major victims of it were the traditionally well-heeled middle classes, manufacturing sectors uh, of the developed world. So this gave rise to this, this idea of, of populism as a political force in some ways. And that could only be explained uh, in a range of different ways. And one of them was the rise of identity politics. Uh, and it's identity politics that sheets home the relationship specifically between uh, culture and the civilization uh, argument in international relations and the traditional political economy uh, arguments in international relations. So that's the link, in short, mm -hmm. answer to your first mm -hmm. question. Now, is there a distinction to be drawn between globalization and globalism, the uh, ideology? Absolutely. Globalization, uh, globalization uh, is, if we think about it, a practical economic activity. What were its characteristics? Its characteristics were open liberalization of trade, uh, financial deregulation, asset privatization, these kinds of things. Uh, globalism was much more political and ideological. Uh, globalization, economic globalization, was in large part underwritten by a theory uh, that we, we know as economists as comparative advantage. And that, ironically, has begun to become unpicked in the 21st century for a range of reasons to do with the changing nature of trade, digitalization, communication, those kinds of things. What happened, though, was that in the hands of populist politicians, or not even populist politicians, globalization became to be called globalism, and the target of globalism were what was seen as the corporate uh, cosmopolitan elites that were the major beneficiaries of globalization uh, at the expense of those who suffered the distributional consequences. Mm -hmm. So to be anti-globalism is very strongly ideological. To be anti-globalization uh, is usually a technical debate over the nature of uh, mm -hmm. the deregulation of finance uh, and the nature of trade liberalization. Mm -hmm. So are we moving into a world where you're going to have two parallel systems, a US-centric system and a Sino-centric system, or are we moving into a world of regionalisms? Because all the time we hear concepts such as, look, obviously, the Great Belt and Road, the American alternative to the Great Belt and Road, which is the Indo-Pacific community, uh, some Indians talking about an Afro-Asian century, the growth of regional organizations like the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which is driven by neo-mercantilism to some extent. Where are we actually heading? Well, if we knew that question, the answer to that no, question, we would be in a, a much more comfortable position than we are. At the moment, the big agenda for the US, for example, is, and they use the word increasingly nowadays, is to decouple mm. from China. Uh, what started out as a Trumpian argument about uh, the gross uh, inequality in the uh, balance of trade between the US uh, and uh, China has moved on considerably. Uh, the trade imbalance 
is a second order question. The bigger questions are about the competition between the US and China for control of the new technologies, uh, artificial intelligence, cyberspace, those kinds of things. Uh, and the American strategy at the moment is what it, it likes to call decoupling. It effectively wants to see the Chinese economy decoupled uh, from the American economy. That's not going to happen. Uh, the nature of the global supply chains are so intricate, uh, so integrated, and so dominated by China uh, that it's not going to take place. Uh, and to the extent that it does take place, the US would be as big a victim of it uh, as the Chinese who are the targets of it. So I don't think in what we might call real economic terms, we're going to see two systems. The systems are totally integrated. I think in ideological terms, there is the danger of seeing the development of a civilizational state on the world. And of course, bear in mind that Trump and some of his people now make civilizational arguments. Uh, there's a quote in the report from Trump that says, our civilization uh, will stand, uh, will not be tested. Uh, there's the, the quote in the report from the assistant secretary from the American State Department who said that the fight with Russia, so with the Soviet Union, the first Cold War was fine because it was a fight within the family. But the ensuing Cold War, the potential Cold War with China, was the first time that America would be fighting against a non-Caucasian uh, state. So there are attempts in some areas. Uh, for example, there is now in, uh, in the US the reintroduction of the Committee for the Present Danger, uh, which had been very strong in the first Cold War and is now geared towards China. So I don't think economically you're going to see the disintegration, but politically uh, you can. Mm. The idea that there might be regional worlds, uh, we've, we've got in the audience Amitabh Acharya. Uh, he's much better, I think he's on your panel. He is indeed. Uh, he will talk to you about his multiplex world, which answers mm. that question much better than I could. Okay. Well, time is unfortunately coming along. I, I have t only time to ask you one long question. A very important element in the whole civilization state debate is the end of the American hegemony. So what is the end of American hegemony? We hear this term. Is it the fact that American unilateralism, which encourages unilateralism by other countries? Is it the use of supply chains to coerce countries, which is against the whole free trade idea? Is it the weaponization of the dollar, uh, which may reduce interest in the dollar as an international currency? Uh, what actually is the end of American hegemony? Well, the, the, the four points that you've identified mm. are, if you like, some of the empirical things. Mm. That, I mean, just to go in reverse order, uh, Russia and China now, for example, are, are beginning to, to move towards doing exchanges uh, in the RMB. Uh, ironically, and this will come as a surprise to some people in this room, the euro has been a lot stronger than everyone expected it to be given the crisis of the last few mm. years. So, but the dollar is still the... the is still the strongest currency in the world. It still gives America what was called that exorbitant privilege. Uh, the United States is still the most powerful uh, state in the world. Uh, the idea of American liberal hegemony uh, was always in some ways overstated. It was never as liberal as it was meant to be and it was never as hegemonic as it meant to be. Uh, but for, for, for much of the American leadership of the kind that we've got at the moment with this idea of making America great again. It's the rhetorical element of it as much as the practical element of it that is the, is the major problem. To the extent that we can reform world order, uh, clearly many elements of what were the liberal order are going to remain. And they're going to remain because they're useful. It doesn't matter that they were American in origin. Mm -hmm. the, the Chinese want to reform this order. They do not want to undermine this order. They benefit from it. They just want a bigger share of it. Uh, they want the rules to benefit them. They're not in the business of turning it upside down. The question is the degree to which the US, not under this current administration, I grant you, but in the future, may well be able to re-engage in some kind of accommodation discussion with China uh, in that sense. So the prospects of, you could say that we've got a, mm. a bipolar world re-emerging again already, uh, but it's much more complex than than that. Mm. Well, thank you very much. And we can, we, we, we address it in the no, report. No. Please read the report. Read and the if report, you don't yeah. like it, 
Stop me in the corridor and tell me, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Yes, regrettably, we only had uh, 15 minutes for that session. You will understand we are seriously over time. Uh, we are planning to end this session at 4 o'clock, which will give you a truncated coffee break, but at least it will give you the opportunity to be revivified with coffee. Uh, can I uh, invite my fellow panelists to come on to the stage now? If they're all here. And your names are around the table. Very good to meet you. You're here. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Indeed. Nice to meet you. Hello. Sorry. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to introduce my fellow panelists for the simple reason that we, are, uh, time, we have time constraints. You will read who they are in the program, some of them like Dr. Yukunin, of course, you've met uh, already. Let me go around the table, uh, inviting each person, starting uh, on my far right here, to state in five minutes what they would like to say. Uh, I will respond with a question, and then we go on to the next panelist. And after we've done that, I will encourage a panel discussion between all of you before perhaps having a question and answer session, if we have the time to do that. So if I may start with, with you. Uh, first of all... You need uh, the, yes. mic the microphone. I, I have Are my microphone, yes. I have oh, you have been lined yes. up. Okay. First of all, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, it's a very uh, meaningful uh, forum the dialogue of civilization, uh, which this morning we had a very interesting debate. Um, and I think that uh, the second session that we will handle now uh, will be in the continuation of the session of this morning. Uh, just, I'm representing now here um, the Turkey, the point of view of Turkey, how Turkey is perceived the value system, how Turkey is perceived the civilization and the dialogue of civilization. Um, first of all, the, the, the question is always uh, people asking if Turkey is a part of Europe or is a part of Asia. Uh, the answer is Turkey is a part of Eurasia. And uh, I would like to just remember to the public here that Turkey is coming from the Central Asia, from the Ural Altaic uh, region. This is why we have more in common with countries like Russia, China, than Europe. We are a part of European history, but we are not a part of the European culture. And this morning we had a very interesting debate uh, about the meaning of universal value. And um, as uh, Ms. Uh, Islam is uh, uh, talking this morning, it was very interesting that uh, we cannot impose a system of value to uh, different uh, culture and civilization, which is very important because this is the mistake of European Union, actually, the Western countries that they uh, just build up this universal moralism, universal values, but they never took into the consideration that if this value is applicable to the other culture. They never take into the consideration the culture and the value system, the axiology of the other civilization, which is the problem with Turkey, actually. Uh, even with the neighborhood policy, we can just observe that Europe always try to impose their system of value, saying that this is the best one. How we can judge if the culture of X country is superior or not to other countries. This is the mistake. It's the, also the, you know, today we are living this uh, actually with the European policies, but in the past it was the cultural imperialism. And unfortunately, Europe is still continuing in this way. This is the mistake of uh, European Union actually. And uh, I would like to is express that uh, this morning we are talking about the Turkey Islamist as uh, saying that it's an Islamist country, I would like just to remind that Turkey is a modern, secular, and Muslim country. 
it's not an Islamist country. Maybe the President Erdogan is following uh, a policy where Islam and Muslim countries is important for our foreign policy because Muslim countries is representing 1.8 billion people in, around the world. There's 57 countries around the world. And uh, there is no representation of uh, Muslim. And this is why I think that the President Erdogan is trying to play this role of leader. But if it's acceptable or not by other countries is a question mark, of course. But uh, now we are just uh, with the new foreign policy of Turkey. Um, we are just witnessing the, the Turkey, observing that Turkey is going through to their origin. Mm -hmm. Eurasia is becoming more and more important to Turkey. Turkey finally, I said finally, uh, understand that a uh, country like Russia, China is very important for us because we are so many things in common. There is more than 300 million Turkic speaking uh, population around the world and uh, most of this population is living in the post-Soviet Union. Uh, this is why we are more in common altogether. And uh, Eurasia will be most probably the next uh, future for Turkish foreign policy. And we will just observe with the Belt and Road uh, project that Turkey will play a major role in this mm. area. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me just ask you one question for the moment. Is the uh, rise of Turkey as a civilization state partly derived from the fact that there is an internal debate within the European Union about whether the European Union is a Christian or is not a Christian community. Uh, we mentioned uh, President Chirac today, who died uh, some uh, weeks ago, who was very keen originally to have in the European Constitution reference to the fact that the European Union was a Christian community. We have a debate between Urban in Hungary and obviously in Poland uh, between what they call a semi-Islamic Europe and a Christian Europe. Has this debate in the last 20 years fueled interest in Turkey yes. in, in going in the direction that yes. you've been talking about? Absolutely, yes. There's, it's more than 56 years that we are waiting at the door of mm -hmm. Europe. And the only problem is not only uh, that we didn't... Uh, um, respect the Copenhagen criteria. The real problem is that Turkey is a Muslim country. Mm -hmm. The cultural and religious identity of Turkey is a big problem. We are more than 80 million population, mm -hmm. which is also a big country. And uh, there is something which is the European countries is forget. There is more than 6% of the European population is Muslim. And there's 44 million people who are Muslim who are living actually in Europe as European citizens. So Islam is also in Europe. Mm -hmm. It's also a part of Europe, a reality of Europe. And Europe sh should definitely try to integrate uh, the Muslim mm -hmm. into the, their public sphere and system. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mehmet. Thank you very much for inviting me. I am going to make uh, four quick points and uh, happy to take questions. First of all, um, I don't think there are civilizational states or civilization states, but there are civilization regimes or civilization governments. So a lot of the idea of civilization state is actually about domestic politics of regimes. And it is there that uh, the effect of uh, civilizational politics is mostly felt. And unfortunately, it's uh, not good. Uh, I agree uh, uh, that uh, civilizing states or regimes have gone, to, uh, uh, gone in the direction of greater intolerance and uh, authoritarianism. But I don't see that as a uh, defining, transforming factor in world politics. Let me tell you why. Uh, first of all, huge differences among civilizing states. India is not the same as China. China is not the same as Turkey. So creating a homogeneous category <laughs> of some kind, uh, to me, uh, is very problematic uh, because of the differences among uh, those states. Uh, second, um, it is not really very new for uh, countries or uh, <clears throat> states to use culture or civilization to define their identity. Uh, we have had that, on every post-colonial state have done that. Ataturk did that, Nehru did that. Uh, 
So Niatsen did that. And I have, uh, in one of the articles that will be coming out in Ethics and Internal Affairs, I discuss how they use civilization uh, to legitimize not only their state, but also the country in different ways. So um, there's a long tradition of the United States is a civilizing state, a manifest destiny, the Puritan um, beginning, even what Trump is saying. If you look at the history of the United States, it is a civilizing state in that sense. Uh, but uh, at the same time, what is the explanatory value? And that's what, as a political scientist, uh, I must ask. Uh, to me, to some extent, the reminds of a class of civilizations of Huntington. So when that thing came up, concept came up about, apart from various uh, other consequences, it became kind of a straitjacket for explaining everything that was happening. So if there is a war between, say, U.S. invaded Iraq, class of civilizations. If uh, Singapore and Malaysia had a conflict, class of civilizations. It becomes a catch-all, straitjacket explanation. But if you look at world politics today, I don't see the political and strategic alignments in the world falling according to civilizational fault lines. I see a lot of cooperation among civil US and Saudi Arabia. You can talk about uh, Russia and India, India and Iran. I can go on. I don't see the world is getting organized according to civilizations. Uh, so therefore, I have to be careful about the analytical value of this concept. And finally, I would like to point out that uh, we have a normative as well as an explanatory or a descriptive mission here. Uh, the idea is to have a dialogue rather than uh, simply explain or uh, describe what is happening. And the dialogue is supposed to lead to something uh, more positive. So I'm taking a normative uh, stance here. What I saw this morning was, to me, too much civilizational nationalism or almost civilizational monologue as opposed to a civilizational dialogue. So, and this is not uncommon. I've seen through many international conferences where <laughs> countries, participants, uh, ex-leaders, <coughs> current leaders, diplomats, <coughs> academics, they represent their own country. They say good things about their own country. How good was China? How good is India? How good is Turkey? And they never really indulge in any kind of self-criticism. And uh, to have a proper dialogue of civilizations, we need two things, some modesty and self-criticism. No civilization is perfect. There's no good or bad civilization. Every civilization is good, every civilization is bad. Every civilization imagines itself as a universal civilization. And, and, uh, you know, and no civilization is a monolith. There are good and bad elements. Uh, as I uh, wrote in one of my articles, uh, uh, there is uh, both darkness and light in every civilization. But we need to have that on the table. And instead of defending our civilizations, I felt really sorry for the European Union this morning because I thought uh, there were a lot of good things that could be said about the European Union. And, uh, and uh, not only since after 1945, uh, after it was created in the 50s, but it, the European civilization itself uh, has done a lot of bad things, but also a lot of contributed a lot of good things. And that goes for every civilization. Uh, th that's the first thing, uh, self-criticism, a little bit of uh, introspect uh, introspection. The other one is mutual respect. You cannot really have civilizational dialogue unless you respect each other. Now, this doesn't come out here necessarily, but it comes out in dialogues. I remember uh, uh, Barack Obama, who president I like very much, uh, once said Vladimir Putin reminded him of a bored schoolboy on the back of the classroom. Uh, and uh, that's the, that kind of language is insulting. Uh, so I always sat in the back of the class, by the way, uh, just in high school. Uh, uh, so, so this kind of uh, civilization posturing, uh, or a kind of even unintentionally, I think Mr. Obama is a fine, fine, decent man, uh, but uh, that kind of thing has to stop. You have to have mutual respect. And that goes to my very final point, the curriculum. When we teach civilizations, international relations, which is my field, uh, as Stanley Hoffman said, American social science, Western dominated. This is partly because of uh, arrogance, partly because of prejudice, and partly because of ignorance. Uh, because uh, if you, st bec and partly because we start our IR from the rise of the West. Westphalia, 1648, nation state, coincides nicely with the rise of the West. But if you study international relations IR with civilization as a unit, as opposed to nation state as a unit, you don't, only have a, you don't have 400 years, you have 4,000 years or 5,000 years. And during that period, a lot of civilizations have come and gone and contributed to world order. 
So unless you bring that into the curriculum, we will, uh, especially in international relations, we would end up always having this very ocean-centric view, Eurocentric view, which many Europeans are beginning to disown mm. these days. Thank you very much. And I, I particularly like your point about modesty. Um, I remember a phrase of the British playwright Tom Stoppard, the reason I write dialogue is to contradict myself. And I think you always have to have the willingness to contradict yourself and challenge your own civilizational first principles. Can I just ask you, going back to the debate we had this morning about what the West is, it was very interesting in the week before the Brexit uh, referendum that Donald Tusk said that I fear that if Brexit succeeds, we will see the end of the West as a political civilization. So it's rather different, perhaps, as, like America, self-made, not organic, a project, an enlightenment project, as people once called the United States. Do you see that there is something called the West, which is a political civilization? Do you share that understanding, or would you define it as something else? Yeah, I, I mean, I teach a course on civilization, and we discuss this quite a bit. Um, the term West, as all of us know, is a construct. It's a uh, post-Renaissance, post-Enlightenment construct. There was no West, so to speak, mm. uh, in the classical period. I mean, you can say that one of the beginning uh, points of the West is that uh, the division of the Roman Empire. So Western Roman Empire, Eastern Roman Empire. But there was also the concept of Europe is very uh, <clears throat> new. Europe was named after Asia. Uh, princess of Tyre, Eu Europa. Greece was not really a Western civilization. It was appropriated. Greece was a Mediterranean civilization with uh, very strong Asiatic links. And uh, all these things, West, Europe, Asia, by the way, was named by the Romans as a province of the Roman Empire. So, so it's a very modern construct. And I think it'll be good if we can go beyond that. It's not going to be easy because it's a simplistic, heuristic device that media and everything falls on it. So when Russia uh, takes up in um, uh, the in Ukraine, Financial Times, which is a very decent paper and I really admire, said Russia has taken Western territory. Mm -hmm. I always thought Russia is part of the West uh, when I grew up, uh, <laughs> at least part of the part of Russia. I just came back from St. Petersburg. They see themselves as part of the West. If you go to Moscow, they don't see. They see themselves as part of Eurasia. So this identity is always political, social construct. It's manipulated. Uh, sadly, not only by the leaders, but also by the media, because it's very simplistic. And dialogue and civilizations should transcend the West, non-West, West divide, and have a global civilizational dialogue. I, in my uh, academic hat, promote the idea of global international relations, moving away from non-Western, that uh, my, your colleague Barry Bajan and I started. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's time to move away from that. It's not going to be easy, but certainly the political use of West or non-West or what is Europe and what is Asia is uh, definitely part of the problem we're trying to address. Okay, thank you very much. We move on to, uh, you, you're living in an area of the world which uh, may be seeing a clash of civilizations or may not be seeing a clash of civilizations, but the but area that hunting them is interesting. Yeah, allow me first to say something more general and then I'll come back mm. to our region. Uh, on the one hand, we live in uh, the time of globalization perhaps one of the most popular terms that characterize our period is globalization. And uh, what characterizes this is the disappearance of distances from the daily communication between people from different parts of the world. Like when, in the past, when I grew up as a young man, you know, the idea that you can contact someone in Australia from Israel, say, you had to dial, but of course you couldn't dial direct, so you had to call the, uh, the uh, operator in the, uh, sometimes in the, somewhere in the headquarters of the telecom company in, in a big city, and you ask to order a telephone call to Australia, and he will say to you, okay, in 48 hours, we will let you know when you can get it. And that's how it uh, worked. Today, you can call Australia, instantly and you can look at the smartphone and you can see the guy in Australia on the Skype or on the uh, FaceTime in the uh, smartphone and talk to him and there is no distance and uh, there are no differences and uh, you know communication is instant in real time you can do deals that once took a lot of time from one part to the other part the distinction between territories and countries that characterized life in the past disappeared. There are no distances anymore. So you would expect that that will increase 
the homogeneity, the cooperation, the closeness between different nations and different countries because of the proximity in, 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 and the rapidity of communication that is uh, so obvious now. On the other hand, we see the opposite uh, tendency. Uh, we see that uh, the uh, many important countries in the world turn to return back into its national framework in separation, in distinction from other countries. W what characterizes now the uh, rhetoric of uh, the Trump administration, and you know, we can, uh, we can laugh at the Trump, it's not difficult. <laughs> it can be very easy if we want to. But we have to remember that his rhetoric represents a, a, a significant part of his country. This is regardless of the manner in which he speaks and the language and the eloquence of his uh, speech and the richness of his English, uh, or, or, you know, or the dullness, uh, you still uh, have to remember that it represents uh, uh, a, a deeper sentiment in the life of America. And what does he say? He says, let's make America great again. America is separate from other countries. He says, why do we have to fight in all these uh, useless wars in different parts of the world? Let's bring back our soldiers to our country. We don't care what happens here and there. The position of America uh, as a global uh, sheriff, for instance, is changing to an isolation, which is, by the way, it's circular. It was in the past, it perhaps will be uh, different in the future, but it uh, is characteristic of the present mood, not just of America. Go to England, Brexit. What do you want more than Brexit? You don't want to be part of Europe in the way that you were, okay? You were not as a full member because you had a different currency like uh, most of the other EU's members. But now you want to pull out altogether. You want to establish your uh, national life in complete distinction uh, uh, from uh, other countries in Europe, which is an opposite to what you would expect from the changing of circumstances in the world that we uh, live in. And we can uh, name uh, many other countries, the Chinese, with their ambitions, the, uh, the uh, Iranians uh, uh, that are, uh, you know, are very, uh, very competitive uh, and very distinct from other uh, Muslim countries, and so on and so forth. So uh, I think that this contradiction is something that uh, is of uh, great interest, and uh, we need to, to think what, where it will lead to. I, I just want to say, to repeat one sentence that I said before in the uh, press conference, I said, you know, all this is true. One thing is that there is a globalization, there is a world, is a small village, and uh, you know, we can be in contact with each other, we can be in contact with guys, I am from Israel, can be in contact with guys in Iran to some degree, if I really want to make a, s a special effort to do it, in spite of all the tensions and the differences and the hostilities and whatnot, and so we can be in touch with everyone everywhere. On the other hand, this is the emphasis on the national interest as distinct from interest of other countries. <coughs> but to a large degree, what characterizes the present circumstances is the use of a rhetoric which may be misleading. You hear some of those speakers, you hear some of those leaders, and you think, and think that tomorrow morning America will wage a war against Iran, America will fight against uh, North uh, uh, Korea, uh, America will destroy the economy of uh, Turkey overnight and all this uh, nonsense. And just beyond the rhetoric, you know, everyone knows that we live in a world where no one can really afford, seriously, a major military confrontation, a, military, a major war. Uh, everyone understands what the prices can be so 
the rhetoric, the big words, the bombastic statements make up for the less of action, and thank God that this is so. This is for the world. Now let's go just for a minute to a minute. our part of yeah. the world. Very uh, quickly, if I may. Pardon? Very quickly, if I may. Yes. Yeah. I just want to say that uh, talking about civilizations and uh, dialogue of civilizations, they, I think the conflict, they, what characterizes the very special circumstances of the state of Israel, which I was a privilege to be a prime minister of, uh, is that on the one hand, Israel is what is known, quote unquote, a Western society based on values that are not characteristic of the region that we are part of. And yet, the future of Israel, and, and we want and we need, and the source of strength of the state of Israel is the fact that it is based on the values of these backgrounds and cultures and societies, and this gives Israel the relative advantage over other countries in the neighborhood because we can uh, uh, be geographically part of our region, but in many other ways we are part of the larger world and we can benefit from it. And yet the destiny and the future of Israel depends entirely on its ability to come to terms with its region. How to, uh, how to reconciliate this, this conflict between the natural background and values and ethos that characterizes our country on the one hand with the different values and cultural backgrounds and religious uh, beliefs of the neighborhood that we live in, is a, this is a major challenge for uh, leadership. I only want to say one thing in conclusion to this, is that unfortunately, the leaderships of Israel in a large period of time and the leadership of our neighbors both didn't rise to the challenge of how to find a way that can create a common ground in spite of these differences. Thank you very much. And because of time, I'm going to move on very quickly, but can I just make one response, but not ask you to come back to it. You may wish to come back to it when we open up the general discussion. When you're looking at the Middle East, you are look, looking at a fascinating area. We had pan-Arabism in the 50s and early 1960s, an attempt to move beyond the nation state. We have Islamic uh, uh, ISIS, the caliphate, as a rebuke of the existence of the nation state, as blasphemous, in fact. And a, uh, it is a civilization state, the caliphate, the idea of going back to this original construct. But the biggest issue that really affects the Middle East today is not political or religious, it's environmental. And this is the area that is being hit first by global warming in a very, very serious way. And if you're an Iranian prime minister uh, or you are a, a, a Qatari prime minister, you are dealing with the immediacy of global warming in a way that most other countries are not. It's an immediate issue. It seems to me that the civilization state debate does not take enough account of the fact that the environment is the most important thing. Certainly for my students and their future, that is what they care about most. And this is what I was referring to when I mentioned Amitav Ghosh and his book, The Great Derangement, that we are perhaps engaged in the wrong debate. But that's something that I leave open on the table. And I'll go to Dr. Yuki. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I was closely following your interview with Professor Hilbert. And, you know, I found myself a little bit at a loss. Why? Because, you know, we very often there in expert society, academic society, political societies, we are picking up the term and then we are creating something to explain some elements of international development relations through the new wording. Sometimes this is only the frame without the substance. You know, when Professor Higgard was leading this uh, Rhodes report preparation 
we started to discuss whether it is correct that term which appeared, I suppose, in one French and one uh, British publication, civilizational state. And we argued, and finally we agree with him, that it is better to use the original meaning, civilization state. Not civilizational, because the flavor of being civic or civilized immediately occurs, surfaces. So in my terminology, and in the terminology of the Alec of Civilization Research Institute, we are using the term civilization state. It term, this term roots from the work of Russian philosophers, Danilevsky and Gumilev. And it is very essential, from this point of view, it is not possible to use the term political civilization which I don't believe, for example, you know, the term economic man. You know, maybe I'm wrong, but you know, I cannot understand that. From the point of view of those philosophers, civilization that is a historically created cultural type, which sustained. From his point of view, the major players were not the states in the world history, but that cultural types which were communicating, fighting, agree, or something like that. From this point of view, in the idea or philosophy of dialogue of civilization, you know, we are opposing the idea that civilization, or as Western uh, experts are sometimes using, civilizational, but let it be civilization state, is not contradict the idea of national state. Because, you know, in terms of the development of political system, it were firstly people. And then the people organized themselves into the form of nation. It was the Stalin decision of national, uh, uh, yes, national state. So the term civilization state and national state, they are just two sides of the same historical coin, if I may say so. It is not contradict each other. The fact that some politicians, like you just mentioned, Trump, is picking up to show it differently, that is just a political trick. It is not academically proven, and so it is not, to my mind, purely correct. So why we started to talk about civilization? It, were world public forum, it was World Public Forum, Dialogue of Civilization, you know, 17 years ago, to start to introduce the idea of dialogue of civilizations. At that time, and I suppose you agree with me, even now there are a lot of scientists who would say, what you are talking about? There is only one global civilization of mankind, that's it. But then where the conflicts are coming from, if they are all the same. From this point of view, picking up with the title of our uh, table, you know, even if we are talking about globalization, sometimes we are talking different issues. Globalization as the development of sciences and sciences and technologies. Globalization as development of the rules of trade and collaboration. And then again, uh, globalization as ideology. If you are not following my way, my list of exclusive values, you are not civilized, and you are not, you know, considered to be a partner. Same with the term of civiliz uh, 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 civilization state. We should understand that the concept of civilization as historically cultivated group of people, as, uh, you know, our short version is that is, uh, uh, to be absolutely sure, civilization is a community of people with historically developed culture and settled way of life, spiritual values, and law. More broadly, we can add that civilization is a cultural anthropological community of people that emerges and flourishes in a particular geographical location and in specific ecological and uh, climate conditions. But talking politically wise, I suppose, and this is our insistence, you know, in contemporary politics, we facing the attempt constantly to create dichotomy and some kind of clash. 
not trying to find what is unites the people, but to introduce what is dividing the people. And from this point of view, it is not just economic or theoretical discussion, whether civilization state or civilizational state or political civilization. That is true nature of the difficulties of contemporary period of the development of the people and development of political system. If not accepted that you know, civilizations are different, they can possess very common values. We were discussing this during the first you know, uh, uh, discussion today. But they are different. You know, from this point of view, you know, whether you are African, whether you are European, whether you are Asian, you know, the you know, prospect of the life, the value of the life, it is common, common. The value of compassion, it is common for many people because it was the way to survive. Then when we're talking today in the morning about, uh, we're discussing about the democracy, it, we see that it is not the label. This is the process that is a value-based attitude toward the settlement of the most essential conflicts and challenges of common, uh, nowadays community. Mm. Thank you. Uh, you're a businessman as well, so let me just ask you a question that relates to business. Uh, Richard Higgin and I were talking before we began our open session about uh, someone we both know, Susan Strange, who used to teach at my institution, London School of Economics, who said, actually, there's only one civilization in the world. It's a business civilization. It's the people who go to Davos. It's the people in the airport lounges. It's not about Sumna. It's not about Babylon. It's not about the people of the Indus Valley 5,000 years ago. It's the people who actually make things change. And Robert Cox, not to be mistaken for Michael Cox, of course, who's in the audience, who will be on the panel tomorrow, says that whenever you go to Davos, you're suffering from an existential crisis, a dual civilizational ship. Yeah, sure, you may be a Pole, or you may be Japanese, you may be Indian, but you're a businessman at the end of the day, and your first loyalty is to that. What do you have to say about that as, as a businessman? I can continue, mm -hmm. I can pick up here, and for example, there was a broad introduction some uh, 10 years ago that this is a Coca-Cola civilization. Mm -hmm. And you know, for those who are employed by this global company, the essence of their life is the prosperity of Coca-Cola company. Can we accept this as civilization? To my mind, no. Same, you know, it is possible to say that business people, business community, mm -hmm. this is business civilization. But this is only label. The substance is different. Business or teacher or driver they are human beings. They are occupied in a very specific area. If you are talking about Davos, you know, listen, the only thing I can say, people are getting there, and that is platform to communicate. But, you know, they made very serious mistake, after which I'm not that fond of Davos. You remember the crisis of 2008? Mm -hmm. Several months before, the most valuable experts, the most grand experts, what they predicted? They predicted the flourishing economic development. In several months, we were all in the mess. That's it. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, of course, the Chinese call the 2008 crisis a Western financial crisis, not a global financial crisis. But that's another matter. Can I go on to our last panelist? Thank you, Christopher. So, um, four points. First, I think that for this U.S. administration, uh, the trade war with China uh, and uh, with India to some extent also is about civilizational clashes. Uh, they've said it. Uh, it's the first time, as Sir Richard pointed out in his study, that a non-Caucasian power has dared to challenge the might of uh, the United States. And when I was reading that, I thought, and Japan? How have we whitewashed Japan? Because Japan was the first non-Caucasian power to challenge uh, Western industrial power. Um, I don't believe in civilizational clashes because I'll tell you why, Christopher. Most of the wars, the culture wars, the civilizational wars I see are within countries, within civilizations. 
we have a culture war going on in the United States. In, uh, in, in the UK, Brexit is a culture war. Uh, we see it in India, the young and the old. Uh, we see it uh, in Turkey, secular and, and, and religious uh, people. We see it in Russia, we see it in China. We see protests in, in, in Hong Kong. Uh, we have uh, Kashmir, unrest in Kashmir. We have the Yellow Vests in, uh, in, uh, in France. We have protests in Russia. So the culture wars are really happening within civilizations, if you want to call them that, within countries and within cultures. The biggest uh, uh, gap I see uh, in today's world is between those who are progressive and willing to change with the times, to adapt to changing times, and the traditionalists, the nostalgics, um, those, for instance, in Britain that are still harking back to the Raj, to the colonial times, I think, you know, and, and fantasizing about what never really existed. So th that, I think, is one of the biggest um, challenges to our, uh, our, our search for common ground is that kind of a drift that's come in. Now, what heartens me are two things. Uh, one, we are creating, uh, especially among young people, but even people my age, networks that are global, networks of solidarity that are global. Uh, Fridays for the Future, for instance, you know, you had people, the climate activists were out in Islamabad just as they were in New York, just as they were in, in, in London. So these networks, this is where power is at the moment, among young people who can connect. They can also be isolated and they can be radicalized, we know that, but they can also connect and create networks of friendship uh, and, and solidarity that they do not have perhaps within their own communities. Perhaps the, the, the young person sitting in London feels more at home with the young Indian in Delhi talking about the same things than he does with his community. Um, very personally, I belong to uh, a cult which is called the Freddie Mercury cult. <laughs> Freddie Mercury, the front man of Queen. Uh, I'm a big fan. And my networks of fans, similar fans, run across the world. Mexico, Peru, uh, Bangladesh, Philippines. That's how we are connecting, and it's wonderful. We share the same sense of uh, culture. We like that. And the third thing is uh, soft power. Now, there's a wonderful book that Fatima Bhutto, the niece of Benazir Bhutto, has just written about the rise of other soft powers. So we've all been accustomed, especially people in my generation, to, as you said, uh, Coca-Cola and Nike and, you know, um, all the American Elvis Presley and all the rest of it. Um, Bollywood is an amazing soft power. She tells the story of going to Colombia. Uh, in a small village in Colombia, coming across a fan club for Shah Rukh Khan. Now, if you don't know Shah Rukh Khan, he is the big Bollywood star. He also happens to be a Muslim in India, which is great as well. And these people said something fascinating, Christopher. They said, you know, for the first time, we see a man who looks like us, is brown like us, and he's a hero. He's making changes. His, this narrative we have never seen in a Hollywood movie. And, uh, and she talked about Turkish soap operas. Um, all across the world, people are watching that. They're watching Brazilian soap operas. So the hegemony, the cultural hegemony of this construct of the West that we're talking about is, is really being diffused. Um, I wouldn't say eliminated, because we all have also, uh, as someone said, Gora rock, which means white rock. We all like that as well. But these cultures are, are becoming very important soft powers. And I think we need to remember that. The world's changing, even as we speak. Now, two things that I, I wanted to come in on. Uh, one, what uh, Amitabh said about how he felt sorry for the European Union. Um, I don't think you should. I think the European Union has a good future, but what we are very frank about uh, and self-critical, as you said, uh, is about how we go forward. What are, what are the choices? What are, what are the challenges we face? And that kind of open discussion that I find in Europe is something I was missing when I was a child in another country. And that is what Europe means to me. It means the freedom of being myself and of expressing myself. And Europe's soft power or smart power is something that we should not minimize also because we live in a hard power world. But I think what connects us again is culture. And finally, uh, to Natchez's point about Muslims being a part of Europe, absolutely. And I think this is one uh, deficit, enormous deficit that we see across the European Union today. I think it's changing because uh, Muslim communities themselves are producing superstars. 
political superstars, business superstars, superstars. So that um, narrative of victimhood and discrimination is changing. And finally, I'll say one thing to you as well. I mean, I belong to uh, th that sort of category of, of, of uh, Europeans who really <laughs> regret that we did not take a decision on Turkish membership when it was needed. And I think that was a big mistake, and we're paying now the price for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we almost opened it up now for discussion between the panelists. However, we do have one discussion. Uh, that's the uh, Argentinian ambassador to Russia. And if we can hear from you, first of all, that would be great. Do you have a microphone? Yes, yes. Yeah. I would invite you to sit here, but I don't think there's a seat. So if you can just, no, oh, there is a seat. Please come and take a seat here. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to try to be more practical. Uh, it's it's my, my profession. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, if from a theoretical point of view, nobody will challenge the values. Uh, if we go through democracy, freedom of speech, uh, so on and so forth, everybody will agree. But I think that the problem lies when we go to uh, the implementation, to the practical dimension. I'm from Argentina. I'm from uh, America. First of all, let me tell you that um, America is a continent. Um, it's not just one country. Yeah. America is a continent of 35 countries. And what I say is because I think that we still have a mentality, <laughs> an old mentality of Cold War when approaching matters. And I think that's maybe the first thing that has to be changed. Uh, Argentina is also part of Latin America. And as Alain Rouquier used to say, Amérique Latine, c'est l'extrême Occident. Uh, we are the extreme Occident. But I don't want to discuss values because uh, you know better. What I want to discuss is practical matters. So um, I'm a fan of pointyism. So if you allow me some uh, brush strokes. First of all, um, you refer to soft power. 20 years before, Joseph Nye and Kyohen uh, used to talk about interdependence. We live in an interdependent world. Let's not forget that. And in, in interdependent world, there's no room for a binary world. This morning, there was some reference to one against the other. We are all alike, bigger, smaller, left, right, north, south. But when suffering the, the challenges of the day-to-day -day agenda, we are all equal. So I would like that we use more the concept of inter interdependence. Uh, we have to recover it. Um, if we are interdependent, uh, we need uh, to build multilateralism. Multilateralism is not something given. It has to be built on a day-to-day -day basis. And it can be deconstructed on a day-to-day -day basis. For instance, uh, the best roadmap that we have in multilateralism it's the Global Agenda 2030, the 17 uh, sustainable objectives. Nobody talks about it. And it was agreed by consensus. So either we are truly multilateral and we abide by that, or as Prime Minister just said, we are just doing rhetorics. If we really want to be multilateral, let's not do rhetoric and let's uh, play by our commitments. And the Agenda 2030 is a commitment of the whole of the international community. We need to commit ourselves to that. And um, if you allow me the last point, which uh, as, as a diplomat, and I'm not just making propaganda to my profession, because diplomacy is talking and, and dialogue. Uh, this is an excellent forum of diplomats, because we are talking and dialoguing. My fear is that we are over militarization, militarizing our political discourse. In the short term, the military solution is fast, is rapid, and I would say it's efficient. But in the medium and long term, it's not sustainable. So we should go back to more diplomatic solutions, putting aside the military response and looking for sustainability. 
So if uh, I could leave you with a message, and again, I'm not doing propaganda for diplomats, is that we should demilitarize the political agenda and b give more room to diplomats. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. You want to come back? I, I wanted to, uh, I want to make two short comments about things that I heard through the day. One was the uh, early in the morning, I think someone suggested that the West is collapsing, and this is a matter of fact already. I suggest that we will not be rushing to judgments of this nature. This is somewhat simplistic. Uh, the West is not collapsing. The most important creations that dictate the nature of the lives of the entire world are created in the West on these days. Uh, the largest companies, the most important films, the most important books that are read around the world are created in the Western countries. It's true that sometimes the political leaders and the political rhetoric of some of the political leaders in the Western countries is not compatible to the values and to the rich tradition of the cultures of these countries. But to draw a conclusion from this to the uh, bottom line that the West is collapsing, I think is somewhat simplistic and is not characteristic of the realities of life. The fashions that, that are imitated by the entire world are shaped in the West. Their dresses, uh, their shape, the way that people dress in most of the world are created in the Western countries. And uh, I can go on and on and on. Uh, uh, a basketball which was created, uh, was created in the uh, Western world is uh, played now in Eastern uh, countries or different cultures that never used to uh, practice it before. Basketball and soccer and what not. If this is sport, just one example of what makes the, altogether the substance of life for the hundreds of billions of people. So I think that this is, if one wants to talk about politics uh, and to say that uh, in, in terms of politics, the Western world is collapsing, it brings me to the second point that I want to make. Look, uh, the, the concept, uh, someone say today that we live in a very dangerous world. Dangerous than more, than what? More dangerous than the First World War, the beginning of the 19th, 20th century in Europe? Dangerous than, uh, more dangerous than the Second World War? More dangerous than the Cold War? That two superpowers for 40 years were standing one against the other with nuclear powers that could destroy the entire world and were threatening each other and talking about destructions and the leader of one nation was banging on the table in the United Nations saying we will destroy you and the other said similar things. Is it now more dangerous than that period? Let's not fall into these stupid uh, and, and simplistic traps. We live in a much more mature world in spite of the simplistic rhetoric of some of its political leaders every now and then. We live in a world which has absorbed the pains of wars and understand the dangers and risks of potential military confrontations more than ever before. And that's why I said before that let's not lose track of the dramatic difference between the empty bombastic rhetoric of some of the political leaders and the practical political moves that are much more restrained and careful because people are aware of the possible political uh, uh, po po uh, human uh, price that we can pay. I entirely subscribe to the ambassador's suggestion that we will try to limit to the maximum possible the need of the militarization of our uh, politics and our uh, international uh, connections and resort into the basic values that connect human beings, which brings me to the uh, something that 
we discussed uh, last night in our opening session. This is precisely the value of such organizations as the DOC, which can separate themselves from the need of making a political impression and talk about values and needs and, and, and problems, including uh, the problem of uh, warming. Uh, although I must say that as of recently, I talked with some very important scientists that told me something which I was not aware of, and perhaps it's not politically correct to even say it. But they said, look, the changes in the climate of the world, as they were researched over centuries, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of years show that the changing of the climate is cyclical. And the idea that all this is created by, uh, uh, by us, for not being careful, for not doing the right things, is doubtful. I just have, I'm not an expert, so I can't pass an opinion about it, and I'm aware of the fact that the general consensus is that it is created by human beings, but strangely enough, there are many, many, many scientists which do not share uh, this opinion. But to sum it up, what I want to say is that these issues can bring us together and most likely, they can be much more cultivated by organizations such as the DOC and others that can cross the barriers of geographic and political differences that sometimes separate us. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, we've opened this up. And goes back to what we were saying this morning. We always come back to the question of the West versus the rest, which, by the way, was a term that was not invented by Samuel Huntington. It was invented by Kishore Mubavani uh, in 1991. And he said at that point, the Western uni unipolar moment, the West would be insufferable and would be intervening everywhere, as indeed it did in the 1990s and shortly afterwards. He's written a book recently called Has the West Lost It? So he clearly feels that, in fact, the West is, the tide is out. But without engaging in that, would any of the other panelists like to talk about that? Could I start with you in the sense that, are you going through a de-Westernizing process in Turkey? Yes, you know that uh, for the creation of uh, Turkey, um, the, the fundament of Turkey, we are, as okay. I said before, we are a modern secular country, mm -hmm. and uh, we are a country where the Turkish culture is very important, but we always, with the Atatürk, try to integrate the value of Western civilization. What is the value of civil Western civilization? It's all the knowledge, all the universal value in bracket, which is also very important for Turkey, but the, I think the danger is not the um, trying to create a universal value, the real danger is trying to impose the culture, to, to impose an imperialist point of view to other cultures. The, the richness of Europe is the cultural diversity. This is the problem. When we look at the world today, we try to create a unique cultural global citizenship, which is also a program of European Union, which is, I think, an error, because the richness of Europe is the cultural diversity. And the problem that we are living today, that we have a monologue of uh, Western civilization the Western civilization is not trying to understand the other civilization, which is the cultural relativism, which is very important. This is a knowledge that forgotten years ago. And uh, in the case of Turkey, uh, Turkey, yes, they are living actually a real uh, disappointment with Europe. This is why now Turkey is trying to find uh, a way with their origin which is the Central Asian, Eurasian part, which is also, I think, something which is very important for Turkey. Europe is a very mean, meaningful peace process instrument, I think, European Union. Uh, but we observe that there is a real conflict between the member states because of Europe trying to create a unique cultural identity this is the problem of Brexit. We are just observing with Brexit and the Visegrad countries trying to also try to impose their willingness to Europe. And I think Turkey will always follow the Western uh, knowledge, the Western 
civilization with the knowledge, technology, innovation, and so on. And Europe is always will always remain a very important partner for Turkey. But now Turkey is trying to find a new way, a new, new cultural way, which is its origin, which is the Central Asia and Euro Asia. This is why there is a very intensive collaboration with Russia, with China, with uh, India, with other countries, and Europe will always remain an uh, important partner for us. Well, on, on, the quest, on the question of uh, West and uh, de-Westernization, um, I, I don't think that's going to happen uh, in the, in the, uh, on the ground. Uh, but as a concept, uh, so what, is, what we're seeing is that uh, certain concepts live on because they are politically meaningful, analytically um, useful, but on the ground, uh, the changes uh, overtake them, and that's what will happen to West, or this idea of the rest. If you think West is problematic, talk of the rest. Well, what is the rest? I mean, do the BRICS actually represent the developing world? I doubt it very much. How can countries like China, India speak for? India speaks for Asia, China speaks. So I think we have to look at the uh, rhetorical value of concepts and what the change is happening in the world. But that brings me to this idea of the global civilization. To me, global civilization is as problematic as uh, whatever, class of civilization, so civilization state. We are, we are moving between two kind of extremes. And um, I like the idea of global civilization, but it's not going to happen. It's like saying world is flat, or we have a McDonald's world. Uh, cultural diversity has always been there, will always be there, and it's a good thing. At the same time, uh, we are not going to have also the other extreme where uh, the world is uh, breaking up into whether uh, cultures or civilizations or uh, uh, regions. So it's possible to find some sort of a middle ground, and I go back to uh, the meaning of universalism there. When you say something is universal, uh, universal values, as I said in my study of civilizations, I, can't, I cannot think of one civilization who doesn't think it has universal values, universal relevance. The Chinese think they are universal, the Indians think they are universal, the Incas and Mayas thought they are universal. But it's possible to maintain diversity and still have what I call pluralistic universalism. So this is where I come back to Robert Cox, you mentioned. Uh, my colleague, I taught, I taught with him for 12 years. Uh, Cox made a distinction between two types of universalism. One is uh, the enlightenment, monistic universalism, that uh, the perspective of a homogeneous reality. That is a good set of ideas, came out of the West, enlightenment. Everybody should have it because it's good for us. He challenged that and he said there is another kind of universalism, which now I have named pluralistic universalism, which means you accept diversity, take it for, um, as, as real, but still you will find there are a lot of commonalities. You can build common ground. And it is possible, I can give you many examples. Uh, I have written an article recently in uh, Science, uh, International Affairs of School of uh, Advanced International Studies, where you compare the idea of just war, humanitarian law, from four civilizations, Islam, Hinduism, China, and Christianity. You can find that almost word by word, they have similar injunctions about uh, not attacking civilians, uh, not attacking uh, dismounted soldiers. In fact, the Geneva Convention is almost word by word from, uh, 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 it's not from, but it reflects the wording of Code of Manu, 300 BC. And I actually put it there, you can read this article, and I quote from all this, that there are certain ideas which are universal, but they are from different civilizations, but they overlap, they converge. I will find the same thing about human rights. Human rights was not an invention of either the West or the non-West in the ancient world. Human rights is a modern construct, and neither Europe nor Asia had it before. And Europe might have developed it a little earlier than Asia, but Europe developed it at a time when the rest of the world were imprisoned by Europe under colonialism. They didn't have an independent voice. The moment the post-colonial states came up, they actually signed on to human rights. The Latin American countries had an inter-American declaration on human rights seven months before the Universal Declaration. The African and Asian countries were leaders in the covenants on civil and uh, political rights when Britain tried to protect its colonies with the support of the United States. 
So it's, uh, it's not true that the West supports universal political rights and the rest goes for cultural and economic rights. But the point I'm trying to make is that ideas about human rights, which is protecting people, but they are in every culture. Not the institutions that are human rights you can claim against the state. Uh, that is more modern in both the West and the mm. uh, rest. But the idea of protecting people is every, every civilization, in Jewish culture, in Hindu culture, I can uh, provide many examples. Mm. So why don't we have a dialogue that actually builds on that commonality uh, and based on actual research as opposed to just uh, simply making statements. And you'll find that you can get into some universal position, not a global position, but a universal position that acknowledges diversity but finds enough common ground to develop a code of ethics. Yeah. Sorry, uh, may I just, yep. just, 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 just um, I totally agree with uh, Mr. Asharya that uh, since the 1990s, since the Iraqi war, uh, in the name of democracy and human rights, there are more than four million people were died in the name of democracy and human rights. And uh, this is why it's not acceptable uh, to try to impose uh, a universal democracy or universal way of thinking or way of human rights and we can see the consequences now in the world which is a tragedy. So, thank you. Let me just uh, invite any of the other uh, panelists to sp speak to this particular issue. May I pick up there we started to talk about universalism. If in your statement I got it correct, you say universalism, this is equal to diversity. If it is so, then I am voting for. But you know, in the concept of recent political movements, universalism is equal to standardization. Be standard, and that we cannot accept. So from this point of view, I suppose we need a little bit squeeze back to the title of this round table discussion. We are talking about civilization state, we are talking about globalization, and we are talking about multilateralism. I should admit that we were hardly thinking how to replace, you know, bilateral world or a multipolar world. And we found the formula, multilateralism, which is referring to diversity of the civilizations which we agree upon. And I suppose we should stick to that. If we are talking about the world, you know, I shall tell you, I'm clinical optimist. But you know, I'm not that optimistic like you, so possibly I well informed, you know, optimist, a little bit pessimistic. The world is dangerous just because, you know, there is a tendency to simplify the processes. Just, you know, to say, listen, it can be a list, exclusive list, of something which everyone should adopt, and then we will live in the world uh, of peace. You know, if we are all the same, then where the controversies are coming from, where the conflicts are coming from, if it is only, you know, the conflict inside civilizations, then how to explain the, the nights, you know, uh, conquer of uh, Arab world? It is not, it is what was not the same civilization, may I say so. So to me, it is very essential what we are talking about. We're accepting the understanding of civilizations as diversity of people with historical heritage, culture, tradition, etc. But we are stating those differences. They are to collaborate and to have a dialogue, not to have clash of civilization. I agree with you here when I read the book of Huntington, he was, you know, in favor of civilizations at the time when nobody wanted to talk about civilizations as a diversity. But he, he pretended that inevitable clash of civilization is going. And sometimes what we observe as terrorist attacks, somebody would like to say that is the reflection of clash of civilization. It is not. Terrorism has no religion and terrorism is not being to be considered a civilization element. Uh, 
The, the German philosopher Heidegger said that when the whole world became European, then Europe would disappear from its own imagination because it would have no one to speak to or talk to. So that's the problem. That's the important thing about dialogue is you maintain the diversity. Last word, because we then have to wrap up. So Christopher, that's not going to happen. The whole world is not going to turn European. Uh, there is wisdom outside Europe, as we're recognizing. And what I find very interesting in today's world is, you know, for a very long time, for centuries, the West went East. We had imperialism, Raj, colonialism across, across uh, Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and, and, and Latin America to some extent. And now we are seeing the East coming West. I think that's so powerful, and this is so exciting. We have <coughs> scholars like Amitabh, we have uh, people across, uh, across the West who are coming from different cultures, if you want to put it that way, and that are enriching our Western culture. I think this is something we should not forget. It has turned into a circular uh, kind of brain uh, uh, circulation. People are coming and moving around, and that is so valuable. I would encourage you, and I tell my students at the College of Europe, if you want to understand countries, don't just talk to diplomats and politicians or academics like us. Read the literature, and especially read contemporary literature, whether it's written by Indians or Brazilians or Mexicans. Read all the people who win prizes, whether it's the Booker Prize or whatever. These stories, whether it's Alif Shafak from Turkey, these are the stories, whether it's Arundhati Roy from India, Fatima Bhutto in Pakistan and others. These are the stories that tell you what societies are really living through. What are the things that are bringing people together in these societies? What patriarchy is doing to the women? How children are being treated? The class struggles? These are beautiful books to be read, and that is what I think inspires us. And if I could just say, finally, today, um, the Nobel Peace Prize was announced. And it's the Ethiopian Prime Minister who's got the, uh, the Peace Prize. And I think that is the also acknowledgement in uh, the Nobel uh, Prize Committee uh, of the world that is changing. That people outside this construct of the West, there's wisdom outside, there's information outside, there is peace, uh, uh, people who love peace outside, that we cannot look for the mirror image. We have to respect differences mm. and find common ground. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we, uh, we do have to end. So we've eaten into your Professor, coffee break. Professor, mm. I have a very special request. I want in two minutes to share with you a personal experience that I had as mayor of Jerusalem. And you will understand immediately why it is relevant to everything that was said here. Please, if it's all Two right. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. I was elected 26 years ago to be mayor of the most divided and pluralistic city in the world. In Jerusalem, there are 42 different Christian denominations. 42 different Christian denominations. More than any city in the world. More churches of different affiliations than any city in the world. You think Rome is religious. Nothing like Jerusalem. You have many different groups, uh, um, uh, Islamic groups, which are different from each other, which are sensitive to each other, which don't like each other, which have a history of confrontation and conflicts and so on. And you have Jews, ultra-Orthodox, uh, moderate Orthodox, different Hasidic groups, each is different from the others. When I took over, there was a big concern, how will this young man at that time, yes, once I was younger, uh, will be able to handle all this diversity and the complexity and the contradictions it may erupt into who knows what. And the advice that experienced people came and told me was, try to find a common ground that will unite all these different groups so that you will be able to keep, you know, uh, uh, some kind of cooperation. It was the worst advice I ever got in my life. <laughs> worst advice. Why? Because it turned out that the most important thing for all these different groups was to maintain the difference from the others and to maintain their tradition and their legacies and their memories and not to try and somehow remove those unique characteristics for an artificial common background that will unite them all. And the wisdom of running a city like this without eruptions of hostilities and wars and whatnot is to try and protect the diversity within the framework 
of common uh, life together. And I think that this is exactly the difference between universality, which is not standardization, universality, which keeps diversity. That's okay. what I meant, not homogenizing. Okay. Diversity two minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah, right? That, that was the two minutes. still find common ground. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, sorry, we really do, because I'm trespassing on the good nature of our audience who have been very quiet and very polite. If you want to talk about universality, you should have a look at the Star Trek franchise, <laughs> which is all about the federation, which the Klingons call a humans-only club. <laughs> but sometimes you do get an ironical moment. If you have a look at Star Trek VI, the undiscovered country, you will find the Klingons putting on a performance of a Shakespeare play in the original Klingon. So you can get cultural appropriation even in deep space on these occasions, and that's called universalism. So thank you very much uh, to all our panelists uh, for their very valuable contributions.